Welcome to the podcast, Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host, and I'm very happy that you tuned in again. I think it is safe to say that about a hundred years ago, Western European scholarship on what had very recently been renamed Byzantium was mired in fantasy and delusion. Prevalent paradigms included race theory, uh, French decadence theory, Orientalism, the newly discovered imperial idea, which is a theological, metaphysical interpretation of a historical society. It it was probably the low point in hundreds of years of interest in the Eastern Roman Empire. The late 19th and early 20th centuries were, in my view, the low point in terms of how it was interpreted. In my study of this period, I was surprised to see what a positive and salutary role Russian scholars played in pulling the field back from the brink of such fantasies. I'm referring in particular to people like Ostrogorsky and Vasiliev and others um, who had no commitment to these Western ideological fantasies, but who also in fleeing the Bolshevik Revolution or the Soviet Union uh, did not bring with them um, any particular, you know, Russian... Um, ideological fixations, at least none that are uh, visible on the surface of their works. Um, And it is interesting that the main textbooks for studying Byzantine history in the 20th century uh, came from those two men and and, and others. But also later, during the Soviet Union, a major impact on Western scholarship was played by Alexander Kajdan, who uh, was a refugee from the Soviet Union. Uh, this, this is a kind of pattern of um, excellent Russian scholars who leave Russia, um, not under the best circumstances. And there's a group who have left now in the current, uh, during the war and current circumstances in Russia. Having said that, among non-experts, Russian um, culture and especially political ideology are prone to generating uh, their own fantasies about Byzantium and very ideologically motivated uh, uses of it to promote current projects. There's nothing surprising about this. It is exactly what you would expect from any country, any modern nation, um, especially one with great power aspirations, uh, in facing a part of the past that is somehow relevant to its own Uh, sort of cultural, religious, imperial, you know, DNA, um, and it seeks to recast it uh, either in its own image or as a warning for itself. Just think of, you know, the complex relationship between the United States and the, quote, fall of the Roman Empire, which generates such an enormous amount of nonsense, um, especially online. And it is also online that you will find the most avid champions of the idea of sort of imperial slash modern Russia as a kind of heir or continuation of Byzantium, the third Rome, Rome model and, and all of that. In reality, there's very little evidence of a closer connection between imperial Russia and Byzantium than there was between France and Byzantium. Uh, all Christian countries reuse the same kinds of motifs or turn to the Eastern Empire in part to find you know, talking points and accessories that they need in the present. But I don't think there was a very much closer connection between Russia and Byzantium. Uh, Even on the point of orthodoxy, which sometimes would be stressed more, of course, uh, but for the most part, uh, Byzantium was seen as a a warning case, uh, you know, what goes wrong because of the last minute union with the Catholic Church. So as a kind of failed orthodox state. It is in fact only in recent times that this imaginary construct of Byzantium as a kind of template for Russian imperialism, Orthodox fundamentalism, and so forth, has really gained ground. And only in some corners of either the popular media or politically sponsored propaganda. And it is this phenomenon that we will be discussing today. My guest is Eugene Smilansky. Um, at a historian at Washington State University, and he has recently published a, a brief and accessible, uh, very clearly written book on medievalisms and Russia, 
The Contest for Imaginary Pasts uh, was published by Arc Humanities Press just now, a few days ago, I think. Uh, and this is a book about Russia, more like contemporary Russia, but looking back to you know its roots sometimes in the 19th and 20th centuries, um, and its engagement with the medieval past and instrumental use of it. And some sections of the book deal with Byzantium from this point of view, and we focus on those. This is a very important contribution, in part because it fills out on the Russian side a discussion that is uh, very much uh, more developed on the Western medieval side, that is the way in which uh, Western European countries, also the United States, have redeployed the uh, medieval past as part of their you know, current conversations and um, you know, cultural projects. And this whole kind of creative re-engagement with the Middle Ages uh, often goes by the name of medievalism. Um, and so this is Russia's medievalism. And we're going to talk in particular with its well, what we might call Byzantinism, <laughs> that is the kind of reinvention of Byzantium to serve contemporary um, ideological needs. Eugene has looked at everything from uh, you know, books and pamphlets to videos and exhibitions and documentaries or documentaries in quotation marks uh, and political speeches and so forth. So it's a very, very well-rounded um, and diverse picture that he presents here of all the imaginary Byzantiums <laughs> that one can encounter you know, traveling along the byways of uh, current uh, Russian popular culture. Okay, let's get to it. Uh, thanks to Medievalist.net for reposting these episodes. Uh, here's my conversation with Eugene. Eugene, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. Can you tell us first a little bit about your own core research, which I understand is somewhat different from um, what's in this book, and, and how you came to write this book? Of course. Um, and it, it is really different. Uh, I was trained as a historian of uh, late medieval Germany. Um, I uh, largely focused my, my first book, and then I, I also published a collection of primary sources that uh, focuses on religious persecution um, in towns and kind of intolerance and persecution in uh, medieval Europe, largely Western Europe uh, in general. Um, and, uh, you know, it was one of those things that I was always interested in. I grew up in uh, Ukraine, in Odessa, on the Black Sea coast, um, and I have family ties with both uh, in in both Ukraine and and Russia. Um, and so, in some ways, many of the things I talk about in in the book, I uh, kind of witnessed or or experienced in terms of, uh, for example, that that you know Byzantine documentary that we'll, we'll probably talk about. Uh, about how Byzantium mm -hmm. compares to Russia, um, uh, the the fall of the empire. Um, I remember seeing uh, on TV during one of my visits uh, to 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 Russia uh, back then uh, in the kind of early two thousands, and so um, it was something that kind of was always a little bit in the back of my mind. And then uh, you know, twenty twenty, my first monograph was uh, finished. Uh, it was the pandemic. I was kind of bored, um, and uh, I was following the news coverage of how COVID was affecting uh, Russia. And I noticed that in, in one of his interviews, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, compared COVID to kind of the ravages of these Turkic nomads, right? The, um, mm. uh, the, the, the uh, Cumans and, 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 and Pechenegs. Um, and uh, that really... As a medievalist, I was like, what is going on there? Um, you know, and, and so I wrote a short piece for um the public medievalist for the public medievalist, uh, which is a great website on dealing with all kinds of manifestations of the Middle Ages in, in, in the present. Um and uh, so that was fun. And I were kind of thinking, oh, you know, maybe one day I'll I'll do a longer um a uh, piece or or kind of longer um exploration of this um and then about a week before russia invaded uh, ukraine in february 2022 um anna henderson of our humanities press reached out to me and and suggested that they they take on this project and i said yes and started putting the proposal together and then the invasion happened and i and i kind of felt like well now i have to do it because there's right. just so many um, uh, so many uh, kind of interesting uh, you know, 
ways in which uh, I think the the kind of current uh, Russian political climate um, uses the Middle Ages, and and I wanted to explore that in more detail. I remember that claim by Putin about the Kumans and the Pechenegs, in part because like I work on the Kumans and the Pechenegs, and I know that you get no mileage from mentioning Kumans and Pechenegs in Western discourse. Like, <laughs> so I was intrigued by what like what public discourse exists in a country where Kumans and Pechenegs are like a reference that you can meaningfully make. Anyway, we'll get to that. Um, but can you first tell us what are medievalisms? Because this is a sort of relatively technical term. So what spectrum of topics does research on medievalism encompass? And what is the range that you primarily cover in your book? Yes. Uh, and that's a really, it, it, it is a term that um, I think to, yeah, non-specialists can be a little, a little puzzling uh, because it's, it's essentially uh, medievalisms are kind of examples of reception of the Middle Ages after the Middle Ages were already over. Um, so um, this developed re over the last few decades, I would say, and it's still fairly broad, but also very kind of new field uh, that covers really everything, uh, everything under the sun to some extent, because the Middle Ages have been so influential, um, right? We can go from, you know, pop culture to politics to uh, topics like nationalism and imperialism, uh, explore the role of, of the Middle Ages or kind of the invocations of the Middle Ages uh, in discussions about race or, and gender, uh, in, in music, you know, music videos, uh, uh, you know, I know there are some studies of, of like metal, for example, and how mm. um, a lot of, uh, you know, kind of rock music leads oh, yeah. into oh, yeah. uh, kind of cer certain medievalisms. Um, and uh, it's often interdisciplinary and it often tries to, um, again, combine these topics as well. So, for example, you could explore video games and talk about how uh, they might um, connect to ideas like, you know, nostalgia or nationalism or imperialism or, or white supremacy, uh, films, and you know, again, everything in between. Um, my book, because as I've mentioned, it kind of developed in the shadow of this invasion, I'm largely focusing on political medievalism. So um, things that... Um, affect uh, Russian politics and have been affecting Russian politics for the last few centuries. Um, and so, for example, uh, I look at how Russia appropriates histories of Rus, of medieval Rus, um, how it claims to be the, the heir or have some sort of special connection to the Byzantine Empire, uh, the way it uses medieval figures like Alexander Nevsky, for example, as symbols of this imagined perennial struggle uh, against the West. Um, and, and in the conclusion of my book, I get into topics like sacralization of violence, even some crusading rhetoric that's been, uh, that's not always present in, in, in Russian discourses. After all, it didn't really have a crusading tradition per se, but, um, has been kind of borrowed ironically from the West, um, and is, uh, being used, um, the kind of sacralization of violence, uh, has been used in, in the recent invasion as well. Yeah, it's important to stress that medievalism encompasses a very, very wide range of research areas. Um, and, you know, you're focusing more on sort of appropriations for national or imperial um, ideologies, um, you know, constructions of national histories and things like that. But, you know, it, the other in the spectrum, it also includes like, you know, reenactments and, you know, medievalist, you know, dre get dress up and whatever, which is one of these interesting areas where people who are engaged in that are also doing primary research right. in order to, quote, get it right. And sometimes very important research, like about food and dress and, you know, yeah. implements and things like that. And it's one of those areas where primary research and reenactment, like medievalist reenactment, converge in this really interesting way. But anyway, so we're going to be talking more about things like uh, national narratives um, and the use of the Middle Ages for imperial projects and so on. But before I talk about Russia in particular, maybe we can discuss just very briefly just some other ways in which um, European or Christian countries have kind of created their national histories or, around the Middle Ages or drafting the Middle Ages to perform some sort of service in them. Um, just to give a range of the, to, to, to give a sense of the spectrum of, of potential that exists here. 
Uh, and you, do you have any, I mean, you've worked on medieval Germany, so you must know German case as well. Yes. And, and it, again, this is, I, 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 there are kind of two things I wanted to point out. One is that, um, as you were saying uh, just now, um, uh, you know, just because I think there's also, like I kind of, in my book, I wanted to dispel this idea that, uh, you know, just because people are borrowing on the Middle Ages, they inevitably come up with some, you know, these very dark kind of, you know, political ideologies. Uh, no, you can certainly uh, animate these ideologies with with medieval invocations and, and kind of pull the Middle Ages into it. But um, I also uh, have a chapter in the book that talks about how the Middle Ages was becoming a kind of space for dissent and for disagreement with uh, official culture. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I always try to kind of dispel that idea of the, you know, quote unquote, dark ages that, yes. that produce like dark present, right? Um, so um, yeah, and then to answer your question, um, yes, there's there's a lot of really, uh, a lot of examples uh, all over Europe um, and even in North America, for example, uh, in, in North America, just since I mentioned it, uh, we know that like in the 19th century, both before the Civil War and after the Civil War uh, in the uh, American South, uh, there was this obsession with the Middle Ages. They saw, uh, you know, the planter class mm. especially imagined themselves as these kind of lords of the manor. Um, uh, Mark ah, Twain yes. calls it uh, famously the Walter Scott disease, referring to the popularity of Sir Walter Scott's novels like Ivanhoe in um in 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 the south um but uh dur during that same time right again that's kind of a high point right of imperialism and nationalism uh we see uh Britain for example or the British Empire uh using the Crusades as a kind of antecedent of the British Empire and for example especially in the uh during World War One when uh Britain is uh fighting the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. Um, they really lean into this idea that they are, you know, finishing the kind of unfinished business of the Crusades, retaking Jerusalem, that sort of stuff. Uh, but of course, yes, Germany, right? We can think of like German nationalism and, and uh, you know, uh, Wagner's uh, The Ring Cycle. Um, and of course, later on, a lot of uh, medieval uh, appropriations were used by uh, the Third Reich, right? By, by the Nazis. Um, uh, but we can also think of uh, Spain, for example, right? So especially during the, the reign of um, Franco, the dictatorship of Franco uh, in Spain, uh, the uh, history and historiography of the uh, so-called Christian, you know, reconquest, uh, reconquista gets to be used and imagined as a kind of golden age, as this glorious past, as as a model for imitation, which again is very fitting for for the fascist regime uh, to to do that. Um, so there is there is a lot of uh, different uh, examples, but of course we can also think of again, you know, collegiate Gothic, right? Is is a, is a huge uh, part of this, right? It's Trying to build every you know, University and it's it's actually really interesting, um, you know, in 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 the area that I'm in in, in uh, Eastern Washington and, and kind of Northern Idaho, uh, even small colleges I've noticed have some you know architectural reference to the Middle Ages mm -hmm. uh, because they were you know they were founded and that some of the buildings were built in the early 20th century. So so there, it's it's really fascinating just how many uh, examples we can we can point to. Well, I'm at the University of Chicago. I'm at the ground zero for that phenomenon, really. Exactly. Um, and I love the fact that you started out by saying that it's not it's not all dark. And by dark, I don't just mean the image of the Middle Ages as kind of dark ages and so forth, but just the modern use of the Middle Ages isn't always the Third Reich, right? Um, and that they're a very flexible reference point. You mentioned Spain. And I, I've studied the history of Spain as I've, I've been there many times in recent years. And it's fascinating to see how a country um, just switches relatively quickly from the Francoist, you know, reconquest and the Catholic king's um, emphasis to the more liberal Spain of the three cultures and, you know. Yeah, convivencia, right? And exactly. Yes, exactly. exactly. Um, and, you know, even in the um, Eastern European or Slavic or even Russian um, uh, Soviet tradition, um, there was this whole emphasis on the Slavs 
the early Slavs as being sort of these democratic free people who resisted imperial control and proto-communist kind of, right that was that sort yeah, of idea that exactly uh and you know imperial. communism wasn't something external you know we've always done it kind yes, of thing yes. right yeah and, and drawing that from passages in Procopius, who's one of these sixth century authors I've studied, who who, who does say that, I mean, he actually does say that. So it's, it's not this, anyway, uh, it's, it's, it's fun stuff. So the Middle Ages are like all over the place um, and in all kinds of different forms. They're not always sinister and, and, and dark and so forth. Okay, um, so it, we're going to be talking about a, a specific modern tradition. Um, so that of, of Russia, well, I mean, Soviet Union and then um, Russia, which has, um, like a number of countries, um, many traditions to draw from, and it has created a kind of eclectic mix from them. Um, a parallel that I'm thinking of also is Turkey, where, you know, Erdogan had, for a while, I don't know if he still has this, but he had this, like, honor guard of soldiers that were dressed in period uniforms from, like, every period of what he took to be Turkish history, um, you know, the, there was a Seljuk, there was an Ottoman, there was a, I mean, there, and anyway, and some of these elements are often contradictory, you know, in the way in which right now in Russia, you've got like Stalin, but also the last Tsars and like, it, so can you, can you tell us a little bit about how these um, seemingly contradictory elements are kind of jumbled together? Or, Synthesize. I mean, what is the common denominator that allows Russia to talk about, you know, Volodymyr and the Tsars and the Soviet Union? Yeah, no, it, it is fascinating because in some ways um, it's you, like you're saying, right? Every country wants to present itself as a continuous um, kind of, you know, narrative, a right? continuous story. Um, and uh, in the case of uh, Russia, contemporary Russia, uh, it had a particular problem that you alluded to that since the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, there was a kind of a dilemma of, of how do you make sense of all these changes and really dramatic changes. Um, and, uh, you know, on one hand, you have uh, Imperial Russia, um, uh, you know, ending with the Russian Revolution, you have the revolution itself, uh, and then you have, uh, you know, decades of uh, the Soviet period uh, that also kind of change somewhat, you know, the focus on from from a kind of internationalist communism to a more uh, kind of national Bolshevism under Stalin. Um, and um, I think the in the end, uh, what they've tried to do, and this is especially, uh, uh, I think, uh, a feature of um, Putin's time in in power, um, was to emphasize continuity um, and and it, it kind of draw equally on both imperial and Soviet historiography and Soviet history, um, and create this idea of Russia as a thousand year civilization that. Uh, ignores everything that doesn't fit, but foregrounds certain common themes. For example, uh, you know, submission to the state and this sort of cult of the state, cult of mm. power, cult mm. of tradition, as opposed to uh, the uh, you know individualism, for example, um, or again that that very kind of long tradition of or very long imaginary tradition, I should say, um, uh, of kind of anti-Westernism, where uh, the West. And, and who is the West changes, of course, from, I don't know, the, uh, you know, Teutonic Knights in the in the 12th century to, um, uh, you know, Sweden in the 17th mm -hmm. or, or, or 18th um, to, I don't know, Napoleon to to Germany to what have you. Um, and so there's always this West, you know, meddling and, and, and Russia imagine as a kind of um, as as a. Uh, keeper of tradition, right? That kind of capital T tradition uh, yeah. as a keeper of uh, conservative uh, politics and conservative ideas, uh, as opposed to the West that's imagined as uh, an antithesis of tradition, as being too liberal, too progressive, too kind of, you know, um, uh, hostile in the overall towards Russia. Um, and of course, there's that imperial mission that that in some ways uh, Russia has always been expanding. And in this, I think the... Um, 
19th century historiography is particularly important because in the 19th century, there's a series of Russian uh, historians. Uh, Vasily Kluchevsky is, is, is probably the most important of them uh, who create this idea that Russia has always been an empire and uh, it's just how Russia is and it's always meant to be expanding and, and, and it's always uh, meant to be subjugating its weaker neighbors. And if it stops, kind of like a shark, you know, if it stops, it it, mm. it drowns, right? It, or, you know, if, if Russia stops doing that, then something bad will happen to it. Um, and I think that idea is uh, that normalizes conquest, normalizes imperialism is um, very much part of, of contemporary um, ideology. Um, but, uh, but I think what's also really interesting is that um, you see a kind of... Um, Again, right? Like there's all these other things that are are happening um, in uh, Russian history that uh, get, you know, again because they don't fit these uh, main themes, they get kind of dropped. Right? So, for example, uh, Lenin, right? Like even though Lenin is still on the Red Square in the mausoleum, or his, his body is, uh, he, you know, he's kind of viewed as maybe not the hero, right? Like mm. Stalin is is viewed as as a as a as a kind of true Russian um uh sort of leader strong man uh, yeah I'm sorry as a strong yeah. man yeah. yeah I mean in, in addition to the themes that you laid out and you laid them out wonderfully in the book but there's also this emphasis on the great leader yes right so you you're looking at the middle ages and you're sort of picking out people who stand in for the current great leader and is it whether it's Nevsky or Stalin or whatever and, and Lenin is not exactly like that mold of person um i think it would be a different kind of regime that would turn to him um anyway by the way because i mentioned um erdogan and turkey i should also mention greece obviously and if anyone is interested in seeing this depicted visually the opening ceremony of the 2004 olympics in athens is such a wonderful demonstration of this where you're just like you know, pagans and Christians and ancients and moderns and Democrats and imperialists all just kind of part of the same, you know, the same story. Um, A and, rich yeah. tapestry, right? Yes. With all these different strands. Yes. I mean, you know, being on the, the Aegean and the Mediterranean, it all has a different kind of style to it. But, you know, be that as it may. Um, so, yeah, we've got this thousand, thousand year history that Russia is, you know, as everyone else, sort of picking and choosing what to emphasize and what not. So let's talk about the connections to Byzantium specifically. And maybe we can start off by, could you tell us about the connections to Byzantium that were being postulated or forged or whatever before the mid 19th century in Russia? Yes. I, and, and again, I think a lot of it is, is, uh, that a lot of that kind of work of making these connections uh, comes before the 19th century, um, but it comes in a very particular uh, context because starting around kind of late 15th century, uh, which of course is after the Byzantine Empire has already um, uh, ended, uh, we see this really interesting uh, moment where the 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 Grand Principality of, of Moscow is starting to assert uh, more power, more power over its neighbors. It gets um, uh, kind of more uh, away from um, its its previous uh, sort of client status of, of in the in the Golden Horde, um, and uh, it tries to assert some kind of. Um, Again, this a glorious, you know, past or some kind of past for itself. Um, especially the kind of past that would maybe get um, European rulers to view this this new principality uh, with uh, more uh, respect and kind of pay more attention to it. And of course, connecting itself to the Byzantine Empire um, uh, made made some amount of sense strategically. And so, for example, uh, we see that um, the rulers of, of Moscow, um, such as Grand Prince Ivan uh, III, and then his grandson, Ivan IV, better known as, as, as Ivan the Terrible, um, they keep making these claims uh, to Moscow's and, and, and Rus's connection to the Byzantine Empire. Uh, for instance, um, Ivan III uh, famously marries uh, Zoe 
uh, Paleologa, uh, the, the niece of the last uh, Byzantine emperor, who at that point is a is a kind of refugee, high status refugee in um, Italy. Uh, but a lot of this is not so much as, uh, oh, we want to be the Byzantines or we want to have this really kind of firm connection to the Byzant to, to the Byzantine Empire. After all, the empire was already gone, but rather, again, to create an image of Moscow as uh, a respectable um, um, and, and kind of powerful um, state. Uh, we see the same thing happening with the two-headed eagle, uh, which is, again, is often imagined, oh, you know, Russia took the eagle from the Byzantines because they imagined themselves as the heirs to the Byzantine Empire. But actually, we see that, um, again, Ivan III adopts this two-headed eagle, um, not so much from the Byzantines or because of the Byzantines, but rather because he's trying to deal during this time, this is very late, um uh 15th century uh he's trying to deal with the holy roman emperor he's trying to have his daughter marry um the son the heir of of the holy roman empire um and uh he needs to raise his prestige um and so he starts to use the two-headed eagle of course the holy roman empire emperor is also using a two-headed eagle mm -hmm. um and and so it creates this idea of parity and kind of uh, you know, equality between the two. Um, and um, so it's, it's again, it's, it's in, ironically, if, if much later uh, in Russia, uh, the Byzantine Empire is often invoked to stress the kind of difference between Russia and the rest of Europe. In this case, the Byzantium was like a gateway into being accepted um, in, uh, in Europe. Um, and of course, we also see um, uh, some clerical authors, although again, in a very kind of touch and go way, uh, that might invoke the Byzantine Empire, might invoke Rome, um, in their writings. But I think it's very important, and we, I think, as as as, as medievalists, know this to look at the context, right? Like, like if someone says, uh, that, uh, or you know, someone compares, um, a, you know, a, a Russian prince or, or, or uh, you know, prince of Moscow as, you know, to Constantine or something like that. Um, like that doesn't necessarily mean that they mean that they think that, you know, Moscow is the heir of Rome. Mm -hmm. They're, 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 you know, they're making other claims they're making perhaps claims having to do again, specifically with the religion rather than, 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 than politics per se. Um, uh, but also on the other hand, we see Russian rulers being critical of Byzantium since again, after all, it did fall, right? So, so uh, you know, one uh, political thinker during the reign of Ivan IV says, well, maybe Russia should actually, uh, if they want to imitate someone, they should probably imitate the Ottomans, since the Ottomans at that point were uh, ascending and, 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 and a much more powerful, um, uh, much more powerful empire. Um, so, so again, I think uh, a lot of these connections get, uh, they're, they're made, or these claims are made with specific purposes in mind, um, at the time, and then get um, uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, blown out of proportion or or misinterpreted uh, much later in the 19th century. And then, of course, we have the Greek project, uh, which which is its own its own beast. Before we talk about that, I, I just wanted to to weigh in a little bit with my own views about what you were just describing, and maybe just to kind of put my own cards on the table handy, and you don't have to agree with this, but it, it's something that I've been looking into recently. And let me just say, I am not persuaded that like early imperial Russia before the late 19th century, that there's any serious identification with the history of the Byzantine Empire or sense of continuity or anything like that. And all of the things that you discuss are in fact make much more sense if seen as actual imitations of Western European practice. In other words, connections to Constantine are pervasive in Western European thought, political, you know, dynastic, Christian, whatever at this time. Uh, also uh, uh, tracing your dynasty back to some Byzantine dynasty. Ditto can be done in many for many and was done for many Western kings and monarchs 
the eagle imagery you talked about, it's not from Byzantium, it's from Western Europe. Um, the whole idea of the third Rome <laughs> that I, I think it's more of an internet talking point these days than it ever was like uh, at a sort of weighty, you know, ideological import um, in the 17th century. I simply see no effort to make it real. And by the way, so I was looking about the the history of the early history of Moscow, and there doesn't seem to be any attempt to make it look like Rome or Constantinople. Instead, the symbolism, you know, to the degree that they borrow any, is Jerusalem. Um, and so that the ceremonies and everything is meant to recreate Jerusalem. I think that the third Rome um, idea, weak and marginal though it that it was is I think more intended to refer to um, like uh, orthodox continuity. And to on that point, yes, like th there was definitely a, a, a genealogical trajectory that was traced from uh, Constantinople to uh, Muscovy and then, you know, Russia, except I keep finding that in the process, they're disparaging Constantinople. And I think it's because of the union, right? So the, the idea in Russia is not that, oh, we're continuing the great tradition of orthodoxy from the Byzantines and we are their heirs, but rather that the Byzantines betrayed it and were the true custodians of orthodoxy because they went with the West. And it's not until like the late 19th century that that kind of changes. Anyway, sorry, I just had to have my piece because... I get email, Eugene. I get email. <laughs> you know, as a as a Byzantist, it's like, well, what about Third Rome? And I like, oh no. Yeah. No, no, you're you're absolutely correct, and and that's something that again, I was I was trying to uh to to dispel that it's always in dialogue with the West. It's always trying to kind of imitate what the West is doing. Um, and and yes, you're absolutely right. Like there's a great article um that I probably will butcher the title of, but it's it's something like Moscow Third Rome. Um, what does Third Rome, Rome have to say about well, Second Rome? Is this Sergei right, or something like that, or like? Well, no, that one, that one is, yeah, that one is great, right? Yes, um, and and actually, uh, uh, yeah, Sergey Ivanov is, is 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 wonderful, and I think you had him on your on your podcast at some oh, yes. point. Um, and um, uh, again, unfortunately, I think he had to leave uh, Russia shortly after the invasion. Yes, there's also making allusions to Kiev. Kiev, for example, right? It has the the you know the 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 golden gate right but there's all this mm -hmm. there's actually much more allusions to constantinople in exactly. Kiev, uh than yes. in um than in moscow paintings uh, but... of the hippodrome and a year sophia and things like that yes definitely. yes exactly right and the sophia right the sophia uh the sophia church right in in kiev in novgorod right and also novgorod right there is that famous uh tale of the white cowl which is the 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 white cowl that that the patriarch wears that supposedly right like it's kind of like the um donation of constantine legend with with an addition right that basically the cowl goes from rome to constantinople and then it like mystically uh is is transferred um to novgorod not to Moscow, but to Novgorod. And so the Archbishop of Novgorod is actually the real, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of spiritual heir of, of, of the, the Byzantine church. Um, so yes, absolutely. I mean, that's, I think that's part of it, is that like in the 19th century, all these allusions get blown out of proportion or or kind of, you know, twisted to, to, to align with the then imperial ideology, um, not as they were back in the, you know, 16th or 17th century. I thought we might talk about Catherine the Great's Greek project, but I, I realize now that might take a bit too much time. And fascinating though it is, um, it, it's such a weird idiosyncratic thing that I don't, and it doesn't lead us to the next topic, which is where I want to go, which is like right now, can you tell us some like current theories that attempt to link Russia to Byzantium? And you, you talked about a, was it a documentary or a film right. that was, and that has lessons like what? lessons are, are Russians or Russian authorities trying to draw from the history of Byzantium? Yeah, so um, so this was a documentary, um, and I think that's kind of the start in some ways, because 
you know, for most of the time, like I remember growing up, uh, I mean, you know, you would hear about the Byzantine Empire, of course, like in, you know, history books or whatever, but it wasn't really these, these illusions weren't really necessarily made um, until um, the early 2000s, again, and this is important, that important kind of watershed moment where um, Putin, after his two terms in office, is um, ho holding this this kind of sham election, which basically uh, uh, elects his successor, Dmitry Medvedev, um, uh, as, as, as president, and then Putin gets appointed as Medvedev's, Medvedev's prime minister, so it's a real mm. kind of uh sham um spectacle but but it still required i think uh a kind of a show of power um especially since there was this idea that Medvedev, Medvedev was supposed to be more liberal um and so you know you needed to kind of show that no 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 like we're not doing that like right? we're still staying the course um and so during that that Kind of few months, so the elections were, I think, in in March, and and uh, the few months around that, there was a lot of different um, uh, medievalisms kind of popping up. One of which was uh, this documentary uh, called "The Fall of an Empire: The Lesson of Byzantium," um, and it was uh, written and and produced um, uh, by uh, Tikhon Shevkunov, who was the um uh well he's this sort of cleric right i think he was in charge of um the ascension monastery i think in moscow i'm trying to remember correctly but at the time but he was also uh rumored to be very close to putin some said that he's putin's um confessor oh, boy. um um, but, uh, and it's still that still gets repeated. I don't know to what extent it, it, that is true, but he, he, he had the ear, I think of, of Putin, um, at the time and since, um, and so he, he created this, this documentary, uh, which is wildly ahistorical. A it, it, for the most part kind of ignores or jumbles actual Byzantine history and um, does that in favor of claiming these kind of parallels between Byzantium and contemporary Russia. Um, and, and again, we see the sort of repetition of those same themes that I've mentioned earlier, that you know, all problems in Byzantium and in Russia come from the meddling West, that um, uh, Byzantium and Russia need to rally around a strong autocratic ruler. Uh, for example, uh, the Shafkinov points to ba Basil II, um, the the Bulgar slayer, as the like the kind of Putin again again that idea of like you know Putin's in the past, right? Like mm -hmm. these sort of like Putin like rulers in the past, um, and uh, and so Basil is viewed as as um uh the worthy ruler to imitate um and then uh his successor is viewed as somewhere weaker um and so it's it's it kind of again mimics this this worry that what if you know the putin's successor is not as autocratic as as, as putin himself um but um there are also you know homophobic and anti-semitic allusions um uh in 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 the documentary it's pretty awful but what's really interesting of course it was very critically received by scholars uh again we've mentioned uh sergey ivanov who i think written a few review articles of it um and and other byzantinists professional byzantinists i think were quite quite um um unhappy with it for very good reasons but even some in the church so then Patriarch Alexei II, who died later that year, um, sort of scolded lightly Shafkunov for for basically bringing too much of present into the past and kind of trying to maybe make these allusions too too on the nose. Which you know, I mean, if you're if you're a priest, you know, and you get scolded by the patriarch, that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> you know, you think that would be a kind of a you know uh, quiet down and 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 go away kind of moment. But but no. But the next patriarch uh, is very much uh, in favor and Shafkunov. I think in some ways, I think is being kind of prepared maybe as if like the current patriarch Carol dies. I think oh. I might be wrong, but I think Shevkunov might be uh, might be his successor. He's certainly the most well-known uh, figure in the church after Kirill, I think, in terms of publicity, in terms of 
you know, okay. being being kind of everywhere. Um, and again, in terms of his proximity to to political power. Um, and but so the, this documentary was, at, on the other hand, very popular in the government, in the military, in the security services. They saw it as kind of you know prescription for what. Uh, what needs to be done. Um, and, and again, it came out just as Russia was starting to kind of re-embrace a lot of these anti-Westernism, anti-imperialism. You know, it invaded Georgia that same year. Um, and um, and also what's very important is that kind of on the heels of that, uh, since the early 20 teens, we see there is a TV station, which now is kind of like a multimedia website where it doesn't broadcast, but you can still see things online uh, called Tsargrad TV. And uh, Tsargrad, of mm -hmm. course, is a Russian uh, kind of outdated name for Constantinople, right? Tsar City. Um, and uh, that that TV station in its kind of ideological statement uh, points out that Moscow is the third Rome. Uh, it's also bankrolled by um, Konstantin Malafeyev, who is a, this ultra conservative Russian businessman with ties to Kremlin and to Putin. So, so there is a lot of these very interesting uh, ways in which um, you know the church, or at least parts of of the Russian Orthodox Church um, and um, um, uh, Kremlin are very interested in again using um, these. Um, using these uh, very kind of, I don't know, tired in some ways connections or or kind of forced connections uh, to to Byzantium, but again, to to pretty much reinforce the same messages as they've always done. So I was reading your account of this documentary and or the whole approach to um, the the Russian approach to Byzantine history as one from which you learn lessons. Um, I was struck by the structural parallel between that and the way in which the fall of the Roman Empire is talked about in the West, uh, much more pervasively and with, you know, tremendous anxiety, you know, still 1500 years after the event itself, where you blame it on whatever, like the lessons are too many sex orgies or too much immigration <laughs> or whatever. And you always use that to like, we got to crack down on the things that we're because we are Rome. Right? Right. This, this is the implicit assumption. We are Rome. And so we got to avoid doing what the Romans did to quote fall. And I, I thought it was oddly similar to that. It's like, yeah, the Byzantines were great because, and we are them, but they fell and we have to avoid the, what they did. Yes, exactly. And that's, that's precisely the message. And I think in some ways, uh, at least maybe to uh, you know Shevkinov and to to some people in 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 you know who are kind of interested in that. Uh, I mean, it's important to remember that like Putin styles himself as a kind of a history buff, and I think a lot of that is informed by by mm. his interests or interests of whoever advises him. Um, and yes, exactly. So I think like the fall of, of Constantinople is like the fall of Rome in in the West, right? And like in, right. like in America, right? Especially, I think there's a obsession with it. Um, but because we imagine ourselves the the, the the new Rome, right? And mm -hmm. Russia imagines itself kind of the new Byzantium, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, both are wrong, <laughs> and both are 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 a historical. But um, uh, but there we go. I mean, they're still powerful. But at least Washington D.C. is actually architecturally modeled on Rome. <laughs> like, yes, yeah, no, that's fair, 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 fair enough. Fair enough. Liberally. Um, so we're now going to go a little bit down this sort of theological rabbit hole, uh, which is because I, I, I get email, Eugene, as I said, <laughs> I'll tell you later. So what is the theory of the Katechon and what role does it play in Russian imperial ideology? So Katechon is uh, itself a, a very interesting concept. Uh, it comes from uh, where it's, it's used in Paul's letters to, I think, Thessalonians. Um, and in that context, it means a kind of something that restrains the coming of uh, the apocalypse uh, or the coming of Antichrist or, or what have you. Uh, but it's very vague, right? Which, of course, makes like these vague allusions uh, are always really useful to whoever is trying to to use them in the present. Um, but it it in particular, I think in the 20th century, it gained a uh, currency with um, Carl Schmidt, who was a German sort of mm -hmm. early 20th century German uh, political theorist, member of the Nazi Party, um, and uh, who who kind of imagined uh, Katehan as a 
um, essentially the state that is so imbued with a traditional Christian sort of values, uh, what we might call, I guess, Christian nationalism, perhaps, uh, that it would then enforce these traditional values onto the population and, and everything is done in accordance to uh, this traditional Christianity. So essentially the melding kind of of, of church and state together. Um, in Russia, the main proponent of this is Alexander Dugin. Um, and Dugin is, I think, of all these Russian ideologues, I feel like he's probably the most famous in the West, uh, in part because of his own kind of self-promotion, uh, but also because I think a lot of um, far-right groups uh, either kind of have relations with him or or network with him, or perhaps, you know, his books have been published uh, in and translated into English. Um, but, um, but, for Dugan, of course, it's sort of that same idea. He uses Schmidt's idea of Katahan. But of course, for him, it's like Russia is or should be the, you know, Katahan, right? So, um, you know, Russia should enforce all these Christian um, ideas. It's the bulwark against the the modernity. To him, modernity is that kind of coming of of the um, uh, apocalypse or 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 what have you. Um, and, and it's a very esoteric idea, right? Like most people in Russia don't read Dugin. He's very hard to read. He's very hard to, he's not a good writer. Um, he's very kind of esoteric. Um, but, you know, he tries to promote it. There are all kinds of, he gets interviews and there is a there's a website uh kind of media website called uh katehan uh dot ru um which is also sponsored by malafey so it's kind of like you know a more esoteric branch of zargrad tv um and um uh, so 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 there is attempts to promote this idea and it's also important to remember like what like dugan some news i think new york times dubbed him like you know putin's rasputin or something like that right like this kind of you know like secret you know person mm -hmm. whispers in the ear of, of the leader but um he doesn't have a lot of direct power i think in russia uh politically speaking but but it's important to remember that that many kind of modern far-right movements um use metapolitics right so they use this kind of decentralized power they try to influence the discourse they try to influence like national conversations they try to normalize ideas and that would make it easier for whoever is in power to put these mm -hmm. ideas kind of through um and so in that respect i think i think dugan is um has some influence uh but it's also important to remember that esoteric as it is in some ways katehan um appeals to Russian belief uh, in Russia's special mission just in general, right? There's a sense of exceptionalism um, that, uh, again, often is, is viewed through the lens of uh, like the Soviet Union's defeat of Nazi Germany, which, of course, Russia has kind of appropriated and and claimed exclusively for itself like if you're if you know if you're studying uh a, you know world war ii uh in in russia as a, as a like a school pupil good luck learning anything about uh you know what else was happening during world war ii except for the eastern front mm. um and i'm not I, i'm not i don't want to like minimize uh you know of course the contribution of the soviet union no. in this but um but it's important to remember that like it gets kind of twisted again out of proportion uh and in general like there is like the celebrations of 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 uh that sort of uh, you know, Russia, Russian or well, Soviet, but like reappropriated as Russian uh, victory in, in the last few decades have been just really kind of just tasteless and 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 kind of so so like just like yeah. shocking you over the top that that it's it's really um, disturbing. But yeah, so it's a it's an esoteric claim, but it's it I think it fits the, what people already kind of believe about Russia. So I think it's easier for that claim to to gain some currency with enough you know publicity and whatnot. Yeah, in my experience, the Katechon theory is a combination of conspiracy theory on the one hand, and mm -hmm. because behind it, at least in the versions that I've come across, there is a conspiracy of yeah evil people. Um, whether they're Westerners in some traditions or Jews or liberals or whatever, to bring about the apocalypse or support right. the Antichrist who's out there plotting whatever, um, you know, Soros or whoever, right? And so on the one hand, and on the other hand, there's the, there's the 
uh, this uh, nation of destiny, right, that has to remain pure in order to resist those conspiracies. And the idea is that God will hold off the end of the world so long as this champion nation is resisting the forces of evil, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. That's that's very much. And again, so from Dugan's perspective, it's definitely that nation or that that you know withholder is definitely Russia, and it's mm -hmm. it's then that's why right like Russia has to embrace because he doesn't he doesn't necessarily and then there are other people like him who don't necessarily agree with everything Russia is doing right now. Like for him, I think Russia's invasion of Ukraine was this moment where like finally you know we're embracing our you know destiny or whatever. Um, and I think. Um, because he tends to see war in this very well, like fascists do, right? And this sort of self-purifying that Russia will, will purify itself uh in this in this cataclysm of the war. Um and um and and rise from the ashes. So um, so I think, yeah, for him it's that it's like, you know, this is what Russia should be, right? It's not always is, but that's what it should be. And then once once it is that, then you know, we'll have this kind of, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll be the, the last you know, the last um, uh, line between like the end of the world and ourselves. Yes, yes. Because um, I guess that some of the email that I get is like, well, in your history of Byzantium, you don't say whether it was the Katechon. And I'm like, I don't know. I never came across that in my sources. Okay. Um, we're out of time. We, I would have liked to talk about the Crimea, um, which you talk about in your book a lot, and and the the Russian annexation of the Crimea in 2014 was also propped up with a whole, you know, cartful of medievalisms, uh, many cartfuls of medievalisms that you talk about. Um, so readers, in, interested members of the audience, can go read the book where you talk about that. I wanted to ask you a final question about the subtitle of your book, which is The Contest for Imaginary Past. So who are the contestants? I mean, who do you imagine as the interlocutor uh, or imagined interlocutor of these um, appropriations? So I think, I think I mean, there might be several interpretations of this, uh, you know, much like the Katehan, you know, it's <laughs> being being purposefully vague there. No, but I, I'm just kidding. But, but, uh, but yeah, I think to me, the way that I see this subtitle um, is that, uh, again, despite the claims of continuity or the idea that Russian history, you know, moves in circles or that there is like a rise and fall and rise and fall all the time, um, it, I think in the book I try to show that, you know, these same themes or same examples of medievalism acquire new, different, very often conflicting and kind of competing uh, meanings uh, based on historical context. Um, and so in my mind, the contests, uh, the contests, right, I think it's plural in the title, are between um, the meanings uh, and their past and present uses. Um, and the way that that actually, like, again, if you zoom out and look at this narrative as it's being presented uh, by, you know, official Russian propaganda, it all seems kind of smooth and seamless. But actually, I think what's very important is to kind of destabilize it um, and, uh, you know, pay attention to like mm. where things are coming from, what what is their history. That's why I, you know, I decided not instead of just focusing on Russia in the present to to look at these deeper roots, right? Like 18th century, 19th century, because I think a lot of uh, by looking at those on those on those roots, you can see how um, these um, you know these these meanings uh, and these these kind of continuities, I think, um, uh, come out as 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 less smooth and less um, uh, you know real and seem seem more artificial. That's roughly what I took it to be, and in the back of my mind is always like the the main contestant, Eugene, is us, right? Right? Pro like professional historians who are not, you know, funded by Gazprom or whatever. Like we're, you know, we have our little jobs in our little offices, and we have our sources, and we have our training, and we're trying to do right by, you know, history, um, and it's it's. I th it's such an amazingly unequal struggle, right? When you have such m massively powerful institutions that have an interest in history being whatever they want it to be, 
I find it amazing and also a source of optimism that we have institutions that are capable of pushing back against that to some degree. Um, so I see it as a very important, um, you know, mission. Um, and, uh, you know, kudos to countries that sponsor that. And they're not all doing a very good job of it at present. Uh, yeah. Um, and anyway, I, I'll, I'll stop there. But um, I, I take your book to be, you know, as uh, a contribution to that that whole overall contest. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I, I hope that this this continues, right? This topic gets more attention. I think there's another book that came out just a few months before mine, uh, I think called mm. Putin's Dark Ages by Dina Kapayeva, that um, I think I haven't read it yet, but uh, it looks like it's focusing more on, on the present day, but it still um, looks at these kind of allusions um, uh, to the past, to the medieval past, um uh in in the present um and uh and i hope that this this will this topic will continue getting attention uh, i know there is a lot of wonderful work being done uh just in general in the field of medievalism uh studies uh in eastern europe uh as well countries like hungary that have some of the same problems of history being marshaled to um, um to to support whatever present day ideologies they have um and uh yeah and 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 again i thank you for for having me thank you for uh helping to get this these messages out to broader audience thank you eugene and thanks for coming on to the podcast